here. I'm going to hand it. Come on up, stand near the lip so you get out of the light. Um, so uh, Viva is the uh, director. Welcome, everyone. Come on up. Uh, Viva is the director. Let me start with you. You know how this project uh, came to you, and you know what you saw as your mandate and challenge. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, well, originally, I think was, this was going to be in a series. Um, and I was brought in at the point that uh, it turned into a feature documentary. And there are lots of different threads in the book. And in a book, you can go chapter by chapter. But the question was, what was the unifying theme of this? And um, as the story emerged with Clayton, and as we began to look um, at different stories in Yamhill, we felt that would be kind of the spine of the film. Um, and yeah, and then... And we and then events took their course. So yeah, I was brought in at, at that shift point. Yeah, but these guys have all worked together for many many years. I'm like the new the new person. Yeah. You're the newbie. <laughs> uh, Cheryl, since you have a microphone, can you describe how the writing of the book and the and the filming were interwoven? Right. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. It's really a delight uh, to see you all, and I uh, hope you like the film. Uh, we actually, it was very interesting, so Nick and I started off with the idea of the book and we started writing a whole bunch of chapters and we had like reams of chapters and as has happened in, in previous, um, you know, situations like this, we, you know, threw half of them out <laughs> and started again. And then as we started the filming, uh, Marrow and Josh started, you know, sending us to these different places, and there were some stories that we, uh, you know, encountered, people that we met uh, that were really striking, that we actually started weaving those characters into the book as well. I, I should say the book is coming out in January, so uh, uh, look for it then. Uh, Nick, on this journey, what were the things that surprised you? I mean, you know, there's some of this that you've reported before, and uh, and historical aspects of this that you must know from previous reporting, but what, what came to you as a surprise? You know, uh, one of the things was that I, I knew about my classmates in Yamhill who were struggling and wrestling with the drugs, but what I hadn't really appreciated until we went back and talked to the families more was their kids and the grandkids and the degree to which the kids and grandkids were wrestling with some of these same issues. And, uh, and in the Yam Hill area, the degree to which some young kids in the school system were um, essentially feral. And that was really very painful to see in the elementary school teachers wrestling uh, with some of these young kids coming from very, very traumatic backgrounds and looking at these little kids and thinking, you know, here's a, you know, a six-year-old girl and she is cooked. And you can say that in school districts around the country. And when you can make predictions about a six-year-old kid and often a six-month kid, and that's not a reflection of the choices that child has made. That's a reflection of the choices that we as a society have made. You know, something that's striking about the film's scope uh, around the country is the way you do find commonalities in places as diverse as rural Oregon, urban Baltimore, uh, et cetera. I wonder if you could reflect on, on that. I, I, you know, I think the United States is such a, has such a diverse landscape and um, you know, the differences between rural and urban, and yet what you're documenting is a lot of similarities. Oh, I think there's tremendous commonality. And, you know, it, so Yamhill is largely white. And it struck me that in the 1980s, for example, I think there were a lot of whites in Yamhill who drew a lot of really invidious uh, perceptions about black communities in the U.S. And there was a lot of commentary about how, well, you know, if people wouldn't make self-destructive choices involving drugs, if people, if dads were part of the kids' lives, if families were strong, then everything would be fine. And meanwhile, uh, Harvard sociologist uh, William Julius Wilson argued that fundamentally the problem in African-American communities in the U.S. was lost jobs and then problems followed. And indeed, that is exactly what happened in Yamhill. And the somewhat 
nasty comments that the white community was making about African American communities exactly were the same kind of process was followed uh, in places like Yamhill. I think there's tremendous commonality um, from Yamhill to Appalachia to inner city African American communities, places basically where jobs were lost, then um, there was this disintegration of the working class. I mean, we also found that, uh, you know, job losses isn't just a loss of income. I mean, it's a loss of identity. It's a loss of, you know, your self-worth. And so that was very um, obvious and distinct and, and, and clear in, in Yamhill. I mean, that's not the only reason that people have problems. Obviously, we saw that, you know, McDowell, he had, he had a job. He had a great job in the military. And yet, when he got addicted to drugs, that created the d disintegration of his situation. But, uh, but by and large, we just um, had underestimated, uh, before we had embarked on this research, just the, uh, the centrality of jobs in people's lives. Um, let's go to the audience for questions. If you raise your hand, I'll call on you. Don't be shy. <laughs> Got a question? Okay. Yeah, OK, I'll get that right here first. So she's asking you lay out the case for what's wrong. You know, are there any systemic changes that you can be prescriptive about? Well, you have to read the book. <laughs> no. we, there are a number of, of yeah, there are a number of, of areas where uh, we think a lot more change needs to be done. So, for instance, uh, criminal um, uh, the criminal justice system reform, uh, where you know we mentioned the war on drugs, where they just sort of threw people in jail when they actually really need rehab. Uh, and I mean, that's really important, not just for men, but also for women. There are a lot of women, too, who are just thrown into jail when they actually really need um, treatment either for mental illness or for drug addiction or, you know, for, for various reasons. And so that's uh, more rehab programs, uh, like the one that uh, Lena, Dr. Lena Wen was talking about, the LEAD program, where they divert you from jail uh, because they see that you need rehab. That should become standard practice. I would just add that we know how to address these problems in part because other countries have. So one of the things we looked at, for example, is auto workers who lost their jobs in uh, Detroit and across the border in Windsor. And you know, globalization, automation cost people jobs in both places. A Canadian laid off auto worker was far better off and their kids are less likely to be addicted today because of policy choices that Canada made that the US did not made. And the National Academy of Sciences, for example, has put out a pretty solid proposal of steps that would reduce child poverty in the US by half. Um, now, what we lack is essentially not the toolbox, it's the political will. And then there were all the other things that um, you know you saw in the film too. For instance, uh, with regard to homelessness, um, there are a lot of nationwide programs. There are, are, are a lot of proposals uh, that actually could really address the problem. For for instance, affordable housing. We need to build more affordable housing. There is no place uh, in this country uh, that if you are a two-income uh, household working at the minimum wage full-time, so full-time making the minimum wage, the standard minimum wage, uh, you can't rent a two-bedroom, if you've got two kids, two-bedroom apartment uh, anywhere in the US uh, in what is considered an affordable way. In other words, instead of devoting 75% of your take-home pay, um, you know, they, they estimate it to be about you know, one quarter to one third would be a reasonable amount of, of money to pay. And you can't find that anywhere in and, the country. So, and just to add to that, what I didn't realize, because there are so many, we're told there are so many jobs in the economy, but it's also jobs that actually pay a living wage, which is what Matthew Desmond talks about. You know, the jobs have to pay enough for you to live on, and they don't. Most of these jobs do not. Uh, was there a hand up over here, right here? Oh, you first, go ahead. Uh, how do you see uh, a cure or treatment for isolation in the context of radical technological disruption through AI? So the uh, question is, uh, how do you see to, to, to address uh, isolation in uh, a context of, of artificial intelligence and all of the technology that seems to isolate us? 
Um, <laughs> well, anybody who just read Nick's loneliness piece um, knows that that is a, a, a killer as well. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, in terms of AI, there is, there's a, a huge debate among economists as to whether or not there will be a loss of jobs. Some people say oh, there will not be a, there will be creation of new jobs. It's a creative destruction. Uh, but what I think a lot of economists, uh, they do look at the aggregate numbers of you know, job creation, but they forget that there are job losses. People will be displaced. And for those people who are being displaced, it's really hard. I think that gets to, forgotten often. And we need retraining programs. And people have said, oh my gosh, retraining doesn't work in the US. Well, it doesn't work because we just don't do it correctly. We just don't put enough effort into it. We don't do enough research and into developing the right kind of retraining programs. But other countries actually do. They actually have very good retraining programs. I mean, Denmark was mentioned. Angus Dean mentioned Denmark. They do it very, very well. Uh, they and, and Canada, we saw when that Nick mentioned when we were comparing just the uh, laid off workers, uh, auto workers workers in, in Detroit versus, uh, you know, in Canada, uh, they had uh, retraining programs that not only, uh, you know, retrained the workers, but they actually looked at the local areas for employers to find out exactly what kind of training the employers needed uh, to, um, for, for them to hire the workers. So it can be done. It just, we need to have the political will and the funds to do it. So uh, Joshua, this is the film's world premiere as the executive producer. Can you talk about what is next for the film or tomorrow? Go ahead. No. Um, <laughs> well, we can't actually really because we're talking to several different people about where it will be broadcast, which is obviously the, the sort of ending point for, um, for most documentary mm -hmm. is that you hope they're going to land in a spot where it's not just hundreds or thousands of people that are going to get to see the film, but millions. And that's something that we talk about a lot um, in all the projects we've done, Half the Sky, A Path Appears, you know, Nick and Cheryl's extensive body of work is that we're talking about trying to reach beyond the choir. Those who are going to buy their book, and you can all break that code and buy it, it's, it's going to be, it, it's, it's though it's an audience of people that are very likely, the people that are already reading um, the column, that already have read the previous work, that already know, um, or care about these issues. So the interesting thing to try to do, and you know, we hope that film does that, and I, I, of course I believe it does, is, is begin to reach people who aren't thinking about that and who are thinking in new ways or who are being educated in new ways. And you know, we're talking about all these things that we have to change in adults, but I think from, for the past you know, many years in all of our projects, we've been talking about early childhood and those changes that happen uh, in those early days and in those early years and what the opportunity of education means. And we started talking about it in places like, you know, Africa or Asia where we were seeing people that were not getting opportunities to go to school at all or who were limited because of their gender or, you know, all of those elements. You know, here, that intervention of you going to school, I mean, the preschool here, you know, kills me and that's just for, for, for kids with real issues. But for every child, those opportunities, and then all the things that come from that, all the hope, all the faith, all the belief you have in yourself or your ability to change your, your, your future and your environment changes everything. So we, you know, it's, I feel like we've, you know, and sure, Cheryl's been banging the early intervention, the early childhood, you know, drum for a long time because that's the big, big game changer is to start from the beginning. I would just add to that, um just two thoughts, and one would be, I think that, um, sorry, Viva. I think it's clear that we live in dark times right now, and I think a lot of the institutions and a lot of the people we look to for leadership are not really delivering. But I think in the film, one of the most memorable parts is when Matthew Desmond says, you know, you look for the people who are there, you don't always see them, and what they're working on isn't always the sexiest issue or the, the headline-grabbing thing but they're heroes every day, and they're around us, and they're yeah. close to us. And we have one of those heroes today in the audience, uh, Major Neil Franklin from Baltimore, who is taking his message of uh, sounder policing for drugs around the country uh, with police officers all over the country and now in Europe, too. So there is possibility for a change at the ground level, and we can all kind of find that sometimes right next to us. And also, we have our team here, yeah. an incredible uh, contribution. This is, uh, it takes a village, and uh, 
if you guys want to stand up and acknowledge uh, the whole show of force, show of force uh, team. writ large up in the audience. Yeah. Nothing happens without um, the incredible hard work of the people in our company. The amazing My editor, Howard Sharp, Wolfgang Held, fantastic DP, Ruben, Christina, uh, all you guys. Jeff Dupre, Jeff my Dupre. business partner and best friend. Bob Hanna, Mark Don't get Roy. anything done without him. <laughs> and Paula, Paula, who basically kept everything together the whole <laughs> way through. I don't know where she is. Thank you, Paula. These well, projects take a long time. <laughs> <clears throat> we uh, have to wrap this up, so we do have another uh, film coming in. There's one more day left of Doc NYC. Hope you get to see more films. We're incredibly proud to show this film. Uh, I hope you look out for the book in January and look out for the movie later in the year. Thank you for coming. Thanks especially to Viva, Joshua, Cheryl, Morrow, and Nick. Thank you.